Good morning, Professor Chidamam, sir. Are you there? Uh, sir hasn't come yet, sir. Uh, I think there was a quality check. I, I, I video. see that he got connected. Maybe he has not yet come. I could see yes, an empty chair there. Mm, I think so. This can take up to 200 people, right? Webex? Yes, mm. sir. More than that also. Mm. Good morning, sir. Good, good morning, Tali. Good morning, Deepa. Good morning. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. We get a lot of energy whenever we see you, sir. That smile on your face huh? yeah. gives a lot of boost to all of us. <laughs> Thank you, sir. <laughs> And thank you also, sir, uh, that this uh, the chair has been established now. Uh, I mean, we have to only find a person to occupy the chair. We are on the job, but we have already got the fund and we have put it into the... ...the opportunity. Um, thank <laughs> you. Thank you. Uh, Your humility no, <laughs> is what is... Thank we you. Want to do a lot more. We will continue to do that. I promise you. Sure, sure, sir. One more good news to you, sir. Who 
all the IITs also. So, so maybe there would be other students also. They may be joining through the YouTube. Okay. So, because WebEx can take only about 200 people. So, we have circulated this to limited audience, our own faculty and our own staff. But uh, we have sent a link about the YouTube to everyone, all the students. Right. Professor Kanchana, good morning. Good morning, sir. Good morning. And good morning, everyone. Professor so, Chidambaram has already got connected. I think he will be joining us in a few minutes, sir. We will start sharp at 11. Namaste. Good morning, sir. Uh, good morning, Professor Murthy. Good Thank morning, you, sir. Dr. Dr. Mondadi, how are you? Good, sir. Yeah. Thank you very much. Indeed, good. We are very happy that our BOG chairman also joined today, sir. <laughs> I am also very happy to see him again. We, we <laughs> saw each other a few days back on that. Yes, yes sir. Thank you, yes, yes, yes. Today morning, I was talking to Professor Ranganathan, my supervisor, and oh, he might yeah. also join the program today. Oh, wonderful. Uh, wonderful. He has recently, you know, fell down and uh, had a small accident. And, uh, no, uh, so he's now said he would uh, try his best to join today. Oh, wonderful. We have one more minute. Uh, if, if Shita, are you ready? Yes, sir. We'll begin by 11. Yeah. So, 11 we will start. Your uh, Bangalore base, sir, or you're still Delhi based? Are you based in Bangalore, Dr. Damra? I didn't fall. Are you are you based in Bangalore? No, no, no. No, I'm in Bombay. I'm in Bombay. I'm actually now in BRC. Oh. I'm a Homi Baba Chair Professor in BRC. <laughs> you see that behind me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's my yeah. lifeline. That's true. That's <laughs> true. That's true. 
that's your contribution. Yes, that's significant. Yes. <clears throat> Ipshita, we can start Ipshita. All right. A very warm good morning to all the degree trees, yes, and delegates. I'm Ipshita Joshi, and I'll be your master of ceremony for the day. With great joy and immense exultation, I feel privileged to extend my warm welcome to all those present here to celebrate the National Science Day 2021. The National Science Day is celebrated in India on the 28th of February each year to mark the discovery of the Raman effect by the great Indian physicist Sir C. B. Raman, for which he was also awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1930. Adjusting to the new normal this year, IITH is celebrating its National Science Day virtually. Beginning the program, I would now like to request our director, Professor B. S. Murthy, sir, to deliver the welcome address. Good morning, friends. First of all, I'm grateful to Professor Chidambaram for having accepted our invitation uh, and joined this program. And I'm also grateful to our BOG chairman, Dr. Mohan Redigaru, for joining this program. Today is a very special day for all scientists and technologists in India. Okay, A day where we should all take a oath that we pursue excellence in science and technology. And Sir C. V. Raman is a, a standard example for us that he not only did science and the Raman effect now has really did so much in the technology of spectroscopy. And if you, every lab now, you see these spectroscopes all around us. And, and so it is also important to uh, dream. Mm, I, Abdul Kalam sir used to always say in his uh, ignited minds, I do not know how many of you have read that book where he says we should all dream and dream should be as colorful as possible. And uh, we have great examples of people who have dreamt like that. And a standing example in front of us is Dr. Chidambaram, who dreamt about the, uh, the nuclear capabilities of India. Pokhran is a standing example in front of us that if you dream big, uh, and at the same time that that you plan well and execute well and you have a strong will to execute your plans you can do uh, miracles and uh, and he is uh, an example for all of us to draw a lot of inspiration from and i also strongly feel the science is interdisciplinary and uh, and that's what iit hyderabad is also trying to uh, you know kind of encourage more and more you see that this year uh, from August 2021, we are starting uh, interdisciplinary PhD program. About 30 PhD seats are allocated for that. We have started all the interdisciplinary projects, supporting faculty members uh, doing uh, research together with faculty of the department. We have started a number of ID uh, and tech programs. This is this all to see that we come together, uh, people of various fields, and work together so that. We have a synergy being demonstrated so that we will be able to do much better than what we are doing. I also feel all the students and faculty sitting here should also remember that we should all be, always be locally relevant. This is also very, very important uh, to ensure that our uh, uh, not so privileged people in the country get benefited from whatever we do. And this is something which I request all of you to keep it in mind. At IIT Hyderabad, we started recently a rural development center. We started giving funding to our faculty members to do uh, projects in that particular area. And I request all of you to keep this uh, as, as a, a main thread uh, in their research to see that everything that we do has some uh, someone getting benefited uh, through our research. And, and with these few words, I welcome all of you once again for this particular program. And we are eagerly looking forward to listening to Dr. Chidambaram and his uh, vision for the basic science for India. Thank you very much. Very well, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Next, we would like to have the presidential address by Padim Sri, Dr. B. V. R. Mohan Reddy, the chairman of the Board of Governors. Sir, please deliver your welcome address, your presidential address. Good morning to um, all of you um, and uh, 
a special welcome to uh, Dr. Uh, Chidambaram for today's uh, National uh, Science Day celebrations at IIT Hyderabad. Professor Murthy couldn't have found uh, a better uh, guest uh, speaker for today than uh, Dr. Chidambaram. For uh, he is uh, one of the most distinguished physicists in this country. Outstanding work that he has done uh, in making sure that uh, India became self-sufficient in many areas. And especially, uh, I think, in the nuclear weapons book, his uh, uh, contribution has been uh, very, very high. Warm welcome to you, sir, uh, Dr. Chidambaram, uh, to uh, this uh, event of IIT Hyderabad. The 28th of uh, February, we are celebrate uh, the National Science Day, which also uh, coincides uh, on which uh, Dr. Uh, or Sir C. Sir C. V. Sir Dr. C. V. invented uh, and published uh, the Raman effect. That was uh, uh, almost, I think, uh, uh, getting close to 100 years now. That 1928. And a uh, common amount of effect on mankind thereafter. Professor Murthy was talking about how we are seeing uh, spectrographic uh, equipment all around and how much amount of contribution that's done. Like many of you in my early years too, which is probably a long time back, still resonates very well in my mind. Three things that I learned out of uh, uh, my first reading of uh, biography of uh, Sir C. V. Raman. The first one is curiosity. Uh, he, he, were, he was actually on a ship when he saw the color of the ocean to be blue. And that's when he started challenging, why is it blue? And what is that to me, uh, to my mind? That is where actually uh, out of curiosity is an innovation coming out. Innovation will come out of your uh, challenge the status quo. He challenged what people knew at that point of time. So that was an amazing lesson that I always carry in my mind. And that's one thing that I want all my uh, elderly friends, but also the younger friends, more importantly, carry it with you to say, if you truly want to become an innovation nation, then I think very important is that we should become a lot more curious in everything. Why? Why? Interestingly, which always stayed in my mind was that uh, he was a physicist by training and his uh, first job was actually in finance. He was the assistant accountant general in uh, the, uh, the then government. So therefore, you look at it, physicist uh, doing a job in finance or accounting. Interdisciplinary, that's what we keep calling. <laughs> but, but to me, what applied is you learn one thing. After learning others is not difficult at all. It's just a question of having uh, that amount of mindset to say, I can apply the knowledge I have. So I think we should not at this point of time limit ourselves with these barriers that are there. That again will lead into innovation. And one of the key challenges, I, and uh, um, Dr. Murthy and I uh, talked about it an event about three or four months back, is also the application of engineering and medical sciences. That's only when we will see more amount of innovation coming in, in healthcare. So therefore, I think that was demonstrated by Dr. C. V. Raman much ahead of uh, many of us. And a third one which also stuck to my mind is that he had a day job, which was the role of being uh, the uh, auditor or accounting general uh, at that point of time. But then he used to go to his lab after 5 o'clock. He used to do, I believe, work from 8 to 5 and then went to uh, his lab to do his scientific work. So if you have passion to me, there's nothing called time is not there. You can make time for everything so long as you have passion for it. So to uh, create all this innovation. So those three things, I thought, you know, I'll re-emphasize, especially to my younger friends today. Curiosity, the ability to apply your knowledge across, time being not a limitation for doing what you can do, is, are the three learnings that we have from Sir Sri uh, Viraman. I think uh, aptly so the government chewing for this year 
as the uh, future of uh, science, technology, uh, and innovation, impact on uh, uh, education, skills, and work. Very appropriate. That is what is required at this point of time. Because we see people think uh, science is lagging. No, science is also running at a pace which is accelerating. We don't see it, we don't feel it, because that's the underlying one. And many people mistake is the, the development or pace is limited to technology purely on, say, computers. No, I think it is in materials, it is in battery technologies, it's in communication capabilities everywhere. So a combination of that science application into technology and the pieces of technology that are there which leads us into putting them together leads into innovation will have a profound effect on every walk of our life, including, of course, education, skills and work. So I think you are all very fortunate to be born in the century where things are at such a good pace. Truly, I think it is an amazing things that we will see as we look into the future. With those few words, I will uh, th again thank uh, Professor Murthy for inviting me. Thank uh, Professor uh, Dr. Chidambaran for joining us today and allow them to take it forward. Thank you. Thank you, thank you sir. Thank you so much, sir, for sharing us uh, what we can learn from Sir C. V. Raman. Thank you so much. Next, I would like to request the Dean of Faculty, Professor M. Deepa, to introduce the Chief Guest and thereby lead him towards delivering his lecture. Professor Deepa, on to you. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. It is my great privilege to introduce our guest of honor, Dr. Rajagopala Chidambaram. Dr. Chidambaram became the director of the Baba Atomic Research Center in 1990. He was the chairman Atomic Energy Commission from 1993 to 2000. Till recently, he was the principal scientific advisor to the government of India uh, and the chairman of the scientific advisory committee to the cabinet. Presently, he is the DAE Homi Baba chair professor at Bach. Dr. Chidambaram is one of India's most distinguished experimental physicists. He played a leading role in the design and execution of the peaceful nuclear explosion experiment at Pokhran in 1974 and also led the DAE team which designed the nuclear devices and carried out the Pokhran tests in May 1998 in cooperation with the DRD. He has DSC degrees from more than 25 universities in India and from abroad. He has authored more than 200 research publications and all he was the chairman uh, board of governors of the international atomic energy agency during 1994 to 95 he's a fellow of all the major science academies in india and of the national academy of engineering and the world academy of sciences trieste italy he has received many awards and honors notable among them are the cv raman birth centenary award of the indian science congress association the Distinguished Materials Scientist of the Year Award of the MRSI, the R.D. Birla Award, the Homi Baba Lifetime Achievement Award, the Lifetime Achievement Award of the INAE, the C.V. Raman Medal from INSA, and many, many more. Dr. Chidambaram was awarded the Padma Vibhushan, the second highest civilian award in India in 1999. Advisory groups for R&D in various technology sectors, creating in rural technology action groups centered in about seven IITs, strengthening the national knowledge network and initiating an R&D program on the design of the advanced ultra supercritical thermal plant through consortium of IGK, Dale, BHL and NTPC. Sir, it's a great honor to have you with us today and now I invite you to address the audience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Deepa. Thank you, sir. Dr. B. V. R. Mohan Reddy, Professor B. S. Murthy, Professor Deepa, Professor Vikanchana, and of course the M. C. Sita, the staff of uh, in good style introducing the programs as they come along, members of the faculty and my young friends, among whom I see the name but I don't. Right, Sunny Mane, very Sunny Mane. Is he visible or only a name on a board? No, no, he has been there, sir. Yeah. Uh, uh, Sunny Mane. <laughs> Thank you. Because, you know, I, I understand the Science Tech Week is starting tomorrow. 
and uh, he, he is the science and technology student uh, secretary and I've been in dialogue with him. Uh, but science day is science day. So I suggested maybe uh, for his uh, sci tech week uh, starting tomorrow, this can be a curtain raiser. Curtain raiser for that. Oh, there are many dimensions to research. You have got basic research, you have got applied research. And I've, as I come and go along, I'll tell you about what I call directed basic research. Not directed by anybody but directed by India's needs in the long term. So basic research you have to take always a long term view. But today I decided to talk about the importance of basic research because basically, sorry for the pun, C. V. Raman was a basic research scientist. And actually I am a basic research scientist. When I was a student in the Indian Institute of Science, I was using nuclear magnetic resonance to look at hydrogen bonding, hydrogen bonding in hydrates. Then after I joined Bach and started working in elastic, elastic neutron scattering, looking at hydrogen bonding in biological molecules. And that is when Dr. Raja Ramana in 1967 told me, why not you start designing nuclear weapons? And then I went into high pressure physics. But there's a lot of, uh, you know, even though we talk of design of nuclear weapons as a technology problem, but actually, if you go into it, you want to look at the equation of state. How does the density of a material chain under pressure, static pressure, we are talking about dynamic pressure, and when a shockwave propagates through a material, not only really does it compress the material, but it also heats up the material. How do you connect the two stages in a thermonuclear device? That requires radiation compression. And the entire area of uh, reactor physics, neutron kinetics, energy release, all these require, actually a foundation is laid by, by basic research. Next slide please. I can do it myself, sorry. Are you sharing the presentation with us, uh, Dr. Chidamra? Yes, the, uh, the yeah, black yeah. one. Uh, no. Yes, sir, it has come up, sir. It has yes. come up? Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Of course, I've been to IIT Hyderabad before, and I'm very grateful to Dr. B.S. Murthy to invite me for today's function. The IT system as a whole has a very high brand equity, both nationally and internationally. And among the new IITs, IIT Hyderabad has been a leader. Do I hear some claps from the audience? <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm happy to note, you know, the last last one year, uh, the new BTEC program in biomedical engineering. And as Dr. Murthy mentioned, interdisciplinary projects. In fact, uh, most frontier areas, maybe I'll come back to that later. Most frontier areas of research today are interdisciplinary. Where does physics end and engineering begin? You have got theoretical physics, you got experimental physics, you got accelerator physics, who are not much different from engineers. IIT Hyderabad mandatory, and uh, that is a IIT Hyderabad DRDO cell focusing on additive manufacturing. This is the most complete word. So 3D printing is also used. EST mission on cyber physical systems which is a kind of an all enveloping system, cyber cyber physical system. And also, as Dr. Murthy said, there is a rural development center as uh, being established. So, yeah, I'm glad to see, you know, the young faculty when they join, they must take off running, as we say it, or the Americans say it. And the seed grant for the new faculty being increased from 3 lakhs to 25 lakhs, I think, 
It's a very, very good development. Next slide. <coughs> so if you come to my room and you are most welcome, and you see behind my chair there are three photographs. T. V. Raman, the greatest experimental physicist India has produced, and we had very good introductory talks by Dr. Murthy and Dr. Mohan Reddy, and they told about uh, the discovery of the Raman effect. Dr. Homi Baba, the founder of our atomic energy program, and the first day of the 1998 nuclear weapon tests in Pokhran. That is called Technology Day, and Pinyas Ramanujam, his birthday, December twenty second, known as Mathematics Day. One of his biographers has called Ramanujan the magical genius. You know, when you hear about, let us say, Nobel Prize discovery, you have a feeling that if you were a little more lucky, if you had been at the lab at that time. You could have made that discovery, and the biographer calls it ordinary genius. But there are some people whose work, when you hear, you ask yourself how any man could have done it, and calls such people the magical genius. And he puts Srinivas Ramanujan in that category. I'll come back to that in our context of uh, artificial intelligence toward the end of my talk. Next slide. This is C. V. Raman holding a quartz crystal in his hand because he was interested in many areas of crystal physics. Next slide. You know, when C. V. Raman announced his discovery, the Sommerfeld from Germany made the statement that India had suddenly emerged in competitive research as an equal partner with her European and American sisters. This is the tipping point in Indian science. What C. V. Raman brought about. Next one. And Raman himself in 1928 writes that various ways are known by which atoms or molecules may be caused to emit light, and that's primary radiation. Secondary radiation, first example, fluorescence. Secondary kind of radiation. Scattering of light by atoms and molecules, and this is what kind of intrigued him. Why is the sky blue? The blue color of the deep sea and the delicate opalescence of large masses of clear ice. And of course, his students Ramanathan and Krishnan, who are great physicists in their own right, became Krishnan became director of uh, National Physical Lab and. Uh, Ramanathan also went into meteorology. Of course, they called it feeble fluorescence when they saw the light scattering from sixty from a large number of liquids. But what Raman says, the impression left on my mind at that time was that we had here an entirely new type of radiation. This is what I think, Dr. Mohan Reddy. Mohan Reddy was uh, talking about. You must learn to think differently. Next slide. You know when Dr. Raman received the Nobel Prize, this is on the Vijayan Prasar Science Portal, and I'll have do you read this. this is a, it's a very moving statement by by C. V. Raman, and he says when the Nobel Award was announced, I saw it. As a personal triumph, an achievement for me and my collaborators. But when I sat in that crowded hall and I saw the sea of Western faces surrounding me, and I, the only Indian in my turban and closed coat, it dawned on me that I was really representing my people and my country. I felt truly humble when I received the prize from King Gustav. Then I turned round and saw the British Union Jack under which I had been sitting. It was then that I realized that my poor country, India, did not even have a flag of her own, and it was this that triggered off my complete breakdown. Now I met Raman very often, quite often actually, 
or from a distance most of the time because uh, he had his own institute not far from the Indian Institute of Science Bangalore still there and he used to arrange lectures and he used to go and listen to him and he was a very tough man that he broke down when he saw that India didn't even have a flag. But today, you know, the young people, most of you are young people in the audience, you have huge opportunities. Next slide. I'll come back to this in a moment. Can you see next? See, there's C. V. Rama's nephew was Yes Chandra Shekhar. He's also a Nobel laureate. And there is a beautiful biography of Chandra Shekhar written by Kameshwar Wali. And Wali asked Chandra Shekhar, how did India produce world class scientists like C. V. Raman and S. N. Bose in the 1920s? In the 1920s, there was need for self expression as a part of the national movement to show the West that in their own realm we were equal to them. Today, particularly for the young people, the motivation should be to make India a developed country and an innovation leader. You know, C. V. Raman and S. Chandrasekhar both studied in Presidency College. Yours obediently also studied in Presidency College, Madras. And it so happens that the same classroom in which C. V. Raman took his lectures, S. Chandrasekhar took his lectures. In classroom, I took my lectures. Next slide. You know, Chandrasekhar worked under Eddington and he combined, he was the first man who understood both the special theory of relativity and the new quantum mechanics which had come out that time, 1935. And used it to define the critical mass called the Chandrasekhar's limit above which the star would not become a white dwarf. Of course, the field is very active now, it's and black holes and so on. You know, this idea which later won Chandrasekhar the Nobel Prize was immediately ridiculed by Eddington. Eddington, Eddington of course, was an expert in the general theory of relativity, but unfortunately, he didn't understand quantum mechanics. So, he didn't understand Chandrasekhar's work. So, Chandrasekhar left England and went away to, of course, he was a very good Shishya, he didn't criticize Eddington anywhere. But this criticism by Eddington made Chandrasekhar abandon the field and the people feel that set back research in this area by perhaps 20 years. Next slide. Go back to the previous slide. You know, Chandrasekhar, when he went to US, he went to Yerkes Observatory, Yerkes Observatory, and which is maybe a couple of hours drive from the University of Chicago, he was, where also he was a professor, and he used to come and give lectures to the in physics, University of Chicago, on areas related to astrophysics. And the story is that the entire class which Eddington, which Chandrasekhar taught, got the Nobel Prize, got it before Chandrasekhar. There are only, of course, two people in the class, Lee and Yang, who got the Nobel Prize for the non-conservation of parity. Next time. This great man, Homi Bhabha, founder of our atomic energy program, died very suddenly, it was a very tragic and sudden loss. But the, you know, the greatness of Baba was, you know, some leaders when they pass away, the entire system, particularly prematurely, the entire system collapses. But here, Baba had created a leadership swarm around it, Raja Ramana in physics and others. You know, there is a book by Arthur Kausler who talks about leaders. He says, the yogi and the kamisa. Yogi, the contemplative thinker, and the kamisa, the man of action. 
Of course, all of us are a combination of a bit of this and a bit of that. But Baba was a unique combination, unique combination. And sometimes one feels he was 100% yogi and 100% kamisa. He was also a person with great technology, foresight, as I mentioned. Thinking of building nuclear reactors at a time when India was not even building bicycles of indigenous design. Next. I mentioned to you that today the young people must think of India becoming a knowledge economy. A knowledge driven economy is an economy which has the ability to develop new knowledge and the ability to appropriate knowledge developed in other countries. We should have a mix of various kinds of research, technology development. Of all of this has to be backed by high quality manufacturing skills. And if you want to progress fast, we need what I call coherent synergy among these efforts. Basic research, the highest intellects in the world, in a country must be allowed to work on fundamental problems of their choice. At that time, Raman didn't ask for money to, to you know, study the blue of the sky. But today, if you ask, maybe they will form a committee with me and Dr. Murthy <laughs> and uh, probably Dr. Uh, why do you want to say the sky has always been blue, likely to remain blue? What a great thing you are going to learn from this. But you know, such people have intuition. You must allow them to do what they like. Then, of course, this is what I mentioned. Directed basic research, directed by India's needs in the long term. It's not applied to such. And it is not a substitute for self-directed basic research. It's an additionality. Next. And this is a beautiful book. I read it 40 years back by Peter Madawar, with a Nobel Prize winning biology, physiology and medicine for the discovery of acquired immunological response. And Peter Madawar's advice to young scientists is always work on important problems, important to science or important to society. Important to science takes care of basic research, important to society, takes care of applied research and the follow through. Of course, this is also good advice for older scientists, Dr. Murthy, not only <laughs> for young scientists. <laughs> I think we can remember this on science day. Next slide. Of course, uh, this is what I have been saying and uh, Dr. Uh, Murthy also said. Advanced technologies today are multidisciplinary. Designing a nuclear power plant, or of missiles, or of space launch vehicles are examples of multidisciplinary projects within an institution. It is the advanced ultra supercritical thermal plant, which Professor Deepa mentioned. When I was the PSA, we took it up, of course, supported by Ministry of Heavy Industry. You see, it's a materials problem and nobody makes better than IGK. And we have to have people who manufacture engineering equipment, DHEL, and the best utility, NTPC. And this involves multiple institutions. And the world over, big science and technology projects, whether it's a large hadron collider or the International Thermonuclear Experimental reactor and India is in many of them as an equal partner and you young guys both boys and girls in the audience in the future India should not only be just an equal partner but must become a leading partner must become leaders next slide see there is a Nicola Taleb who wrote a bestseller called the black swan Black swan, because you expect the swan to be white. The black swan is an unexpected human consequences. In his later book, he uses the word anti-fragile, anti-fragility. If you give a shock to something, the resilient 
resist the shock. <coughs> Taste the same. The anti-fragile breaks down. The, sorry, the fragile breaks down. What he calls anti-fragile gets better and better. For example, antibiotics resistance bacteria, microbes. And I have said a long time back, this is also true of a nuclear program. When technology is denied to us, I don't want technology to deny to India. But at that point of time, technology denial helped us, helped us to develop a lot of things. But now, of course, we are in a position that uh, we would like to collaborate. And uh, fortunately, this always happens. You reach a position of strength at some point. Nobody can ignore you. That's what happened in the nuclear field. And nuclear supplier guidelines are now being relaxed. And we can now further leverage international cooperation. But the initiative should be ours. Next slide. See, I talked about international collaboration. You know, we have the Large Hadron Collider in Geneva, which uh, saw the first signature of the Higgs boson, which was a missing particle in the standard model. Everything else had been discovered, electrons and neutrons and everything. And the Higgs boson had a mass of something like 130 to 150, the mass of the proton. You know, when two particles collide, energy disappears. The good old Einstein equation is used by us in the nuclear field, is equal to mc squared. When fission takes place or fusion takes place, mass disappears. There is a mass deficit. And that gets converted to energy, which you call nuclear energy. Conversely, when energy disappears, mass has to be produced. And energy can be made to disappear by the collision of particles. That is the hadron, which is a proton. And the higher the energy of the colliding particles, the higher the mass of the new particle that you can produce. This is one of the ways the experiments are done in high energy experimental physics. And in Geneva, Center for European Nuclear Research, there is a tunnel. 100 meters below the ground, 26 kilometers in circumference, where protons are moving around in circles, bent by dipole moment, magnets. But they have to be focused. And all the 1800 superconducting character magnets, 60 pole, octopole, and decapole, have been supplied by India. $40 million worth of equipment. This done a long time back when I was the Chairman Atomic Energy Commission. And uh, this is how, because they have, could take it to 4 tera electron volt. There is a million electron volt. Electron volt is the unit of energy, as most of the physics people would know. One electron accelerated through voltage, one voltage, one volt. Million electron volts, a million times that. Giga electron volt, a thousand times that. Tera electron volt, a thousand times that. Tera is a million million. And four tera electron volt proton energy was required in order to look at this. And they got this. And in the detectors, we are also collaborating in the detectors, Tata shoot on compact muon, solenoid, and variable energy cyclotron group in Calcutta on the Alice. And the data comes directly to India from the CERN grid because we now have the national knowledge network which connects directly and I am sure IIT Hyderabad uses very good, it makes very good use for national knowledge network for national and international collaboration. This is an example of international collaboration and equal partner basis because we provide equipment. Same thing we are participating in ETA, International Thermonuclear Experiment. Next slide please. It is being built in Kadarash in France. Fusion and the best at the moment is magnetic confinement fusion 
in a donut shaped vehicle which is called the tokamak and uh, it's coming up in France as I said and India is contributing major equipment and also some other equipment but this major equipment which is a crash chart crash chart is the world's largest crash chart 30 meters in diameter 30 meters in height 3000 tons in weight and you can see the picture here being built under the guidance of one of the DA institutions in Gandhinagar Institute of Plasma Research and the base of this has already been built and installed at the International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor. When it is completed in the 30s, it will be a 500 megawatt electrical fusion reactor. Of course, fusion science, the physicists delight, but the technology is so complicated. So paraphrasing somebody else said in some other context, one would like to say fusion technology is an engineer's nightmare. Next slide. See nuclear, you see, we are considered a leader in the field of nuclear energy. This is the director general of IAEA who came to India and said, here yeah, is the forefront of technology development in the nuclear sector. And reliable, very reliable units are built. And in, in December 2018, the unit one of the Kaiga PSWR plant in Karnataka broke the world record for continuous operation since May 13, 2016. 940 days was held by the United Kingdom reactor. They went on, I think, to 962 days. And even during these COVID times, the Kakarapar 3 700 megawatt electrical PSWR pressure water reactor was synchronized with the grid in last month. Next slide. See, technology is power. This is my paraphrase of the futurologist Alvin Toffler. Many years back, he said, yesterday violence was power. Long time back. Today, wealth is power and tomorrow knowledge will be power. And I also said it maybe 20 years back. What is the basis of all this? Whoever had the best technology for inflicting violence was the most powerful. Whoever had the wealth to convert knowledge into technology became powerful, even if he may not have original knowledge. And of course, knowledge is the one that is the basis for all technology. So what is the fundamental of all the statements, the, paraf the partial statements of Alvin Toffler technology? So I paraphrase Alvin Toffler to say technology is power. Because technology is power, countries and companies try to dominate technology, whether nanotechnology or biotechnology or nuclear weapon technology, through two mechanisms, intellectual property rights and technology control regimes. If you want to be a global technology leader, India should be in the forefront in creating intellectual property rights. An IIT system, IIT Hyderabad is going to play an important role in this. And strategic agencies like PARC, like Atomic Energy, and this we have done, make ourselves immune to technology control regime. When I was director of BAC, I used to say, self-reliance is not trying to do everything yourself, but immunity against technology denial. Dr. Mohan Reddy also is taking. You cannot always say, let somebody do the technology and then we will take it. If that is what you are going to be, you will never be a leader. You will always be a follower. That is what I say. India should have the ambition to be the first introducer of new advanced technologies. After, of course, due diligence. You want only proven technologies, my response is proven technologies are often a synonym for obsolete technology. And while you try to build a strong technology superstructure, its foundation is basic research.
you know, this is what I have said. I repeat again. Now, there's an interesting example in the Manhattan Project. Plutonium. This is where I took the state for engineer's nightmare. Plutonium is a physicist's dream, but an engineer's nightmare. It has what happened as in physics. Dr. Murthy will understand being a metallurgist. <laughs> Dr. Murthy, you know, as you, as you cool the molten plutonium, it becomes solid, solid at about 300 degrees centigrade. Goes into the delta phase, which is about 15 gram per cc. 15 gram per cc. Then you cool it to room temperature, it goes to the alpha phase, solid to solid phase transition. And that is 19 gram per cc. Now, if you do that, solidify it to lower density, take it to higher density, the material will become porous and brittle. Cannot be used in a nuclear weapon. And they went to salute Stanley Smith. And that man who had studied the phase diagrams of actinides, not for the idea of making bombs, he said, add 3% gallium, it will never go to alpha phase. <laughs> <laughs> and Cyril Stanley Smith was a basic research scientist. You know, sometimes if things are going well in applied research and technology, you think you don't need a scientist behind you. But then, if you have a problem, you better lean on scientists who have been funded, who have thinking of the problems in a different context and to, to do this. And maybe I am coming to the end of my talk. Next slide. You know, there is a story, all of you have heard of Enrico Fermi, there are only two kinds of fundamental particles. If the spin is half, like proton or electron, you call it a fermion. Now, I talked about the Higgs boson. And the, you, yeah, many of you young people will know that boson comes from the name of Satyendranath Bose. And all particles with spin zero or integral spins are called bosons. Fermions and bosons. There are many stories in Manhattan. And uh, you know, they were trying to build this Hanford reactor, plutonium producing reactor. And if you want to, the reactor to work, you must know the neutron cross sections of a large number of isotopes which, which are either there or are produced during the fission process, none of this was known. And so they thought they will go and consult Fermi, who was the only man at that time, he did most of his work in Italy, Fermi, now then he went away to the US, Chicago. Fermi, and they went and asked him, and they say, in order to find out what is the cross section, his student writes, James Cronin, we use the principle of minimum, minimal Fermi reaction. They use the principle. You give some figure for the cross section so high or so low, then Fermi became agitated. No, oh, no, sir, sorry, Dr. Fermi. They go on changing the cross section number until a stage is reached when Fermi shrugged indifferently. You wrote down the number. Most probably, that was the right number. And Fermi was a basic research scientist. Next slide. I am coming to the end, but the one more. <laughs> Technology foresight, you know, used to, because I have a one Ramanujan slide. Is it okay? I am not uh, overrunning time, no? Sir, sir, no problem, sir. We are, we are enjoying thoroughly. <laughs> You see, technology foresight is not technology forecasting. Of course, forecasting precedes technology foresight. Find out which technology is likely to succeed in the long term. Add to it assessment based on your own country's needs, own country's resources, own country's priorities. Then it becomes critical technology. And it is have done at some point of time. And you can list all this, and if somebody else may have a different list. Strategic technologies, we talked about advanced manufacturing, additive manufacturing, biotechnology, nanotechnology, MSME technology, rural development technology, and also cyber security, artificial intelligence is all over the place, you being used 
from commerce to cyber security quantum computing you are working on cyber physical systems quantum computing quantum technology all this but this foresight analysis has to be flexible it's interesting a story about franklin roosevelt before in, before the war time actually he asked some senior scientists and engineers to tell him what will be the most important areas in snt over the next 25 years very interesting to miss what happened in the next 25 years the things they missed rocketry radar transistors lasers antibiotics genetic engineering and nuclear energy one year after the committee's report han and meitner discovered nuclear fission and the discovery of nuclear fission was based on basic research i don't think they knew there will be such a large nuclear power program developing all over the world next one talked about artificial intelligence some people are scared of artificial intelligence like stephen hawking they say development of full artificial intelligence could spell the end of the human race i don't agree i agree more is roger penrose and the leading mathematician who applied godel's incompleteness theorem the context of artificial intelligence leading to the conclusion that humans will always be smarter than computers and computer algorithms and any other cybernetic machines that they create i agree with this that man will always remain the retain control for of course they have to have all those human human qualities that's different story i'm not getting into that then last slide hopefully you know there is a interesting i talked about ramanujan and this is a review of a book uh, bottom is gone by a professor from from israel he says ramanujan was a super genius who do you know that the ramanujan notebooks like our shruti he never gave the proof either it was obvious to him or he had no time those notebooks contain theorems which so many years century after his death and he say that intellectually back breaking cost he mathematicians baffled that anyone could divine them right in the first place and this brings me can you can you shorten the i want to read the bottom also can, can you ha huh. can you push it up or you have to no you can okay leave it leave it doesn't matter that is you know robots okay there are assistive robots there is a whole book or no howard gardner about types of intelligence i will not go into that robots with super intelligence and what uh, is ekel says is no enhancement of human intelligence opens a door to becoming a ramanuja no algorithm is likely to produce robots with abilities of ramanuja last slide next slide so on this day let us science day let us think of those great people who worked on important problems who had such intuition to look for problems which will change the world i don't think sri raman thought of uh, raman's spectrometer as a is become such a great analytical tool i don't think for ramanujan thought and you would have been aghast if he had been told that his theorems are being used for airline and hotel booking nowadays <laughs> those are the super geniuses india has produced and thanks to whom we are where we are today and i'm sure the next generation young generation of which it hyderabad will have to play a very important role to we'll take the india further become a leader and become a knowledge driven economy thank you very much dr mot thank you sir thank you very much sir we assure you that we would work hard in that direction thank you no. thank you so much sir it was a privilege to have the data to deliver by you uh, next we'll have uh, the question answer session i hope uh, 
So you are ready to take a few questions. Uh, you young guys ask easy questions, huh? Don't ask them. <laughs> in the chat box. So here comes the first question. Yeah. As a former scientific advisor to the government of India, what is the future vision that you have for government engineering colleges, especially the IITs and the NITs? So you see, the, uh, India has a unique SNT system. Uh, it contains national labs, it contains universities, and uh, it also has got industry. Industry also has to play a very major part. And uh, having selected critical technologies based on technology foresight. All these organizations have got to work in what I call coherent synergy. Coherent synergy. You know, if you take the chain, research, development, delivery. Research, development, delivery. Academic institutions are good in research. It's not my original statement by a professor from MIT, Kenan Sahin who says academic institutions are good in research, poor in development, by and large zero in delivery. Industry is very good in delivery, poor in development, by and large zero in research. Talking about the US. So one of the things we also try to do, which was briefly mentioned, is to enhance this academia industry interface, the development, development interfa interface. Dr. Murthy may know that uh, one of the, uh, in the academia industry interfaces we developed was in the machine tool industry. And we had given a project from our office to Professor Ramesh Babu, uh, Professor of Mechanical Engineering, and IIT Madras pro produced the world's best grinding machine tool with collaboration with the industry, one a company called Micromatic. So, that became uh, a model, the, so the Ministry of Heavy Industry uh, was so impressed that I think they given him some, uh, Professor Mish Babu, 50-100 crores on to send, start a center for advanced manufacturing. And in your technology park, has a, quite a bit of that one floor, I think, where all these are being built. So, this is what one should do. Academia industry interaction is important, but there is nothing like a general academia industry interaction. It has to be technology specific. Then there has to be interaction between universities and national labs, universities and national labs. And the PSS office is already doing that in, in the sense that uh, national will be very good. National lab, because you are, you know, IITs are what? You are between a university and a national lab. You are a hybrid, I think. You are not quite a uh, university. Technology capability that exists in IIT is much more than in the university system. But of course, you can join the national labs to develop further. You have already done it for the, with the DRDO. And I am sure there are many projects you are getting from the Board of Research in Nuclear Sciences, which are, we, I mean, normally we fund them, only they are of some relevance to the programs of the Department of uh, Atomic Energy. A number of other programs we, we looked at identifying gifted children in schools, gifted children. And we funded two projects in Bangalore and, Bang and in Delhi University's young professor Jyoti Sharma who has done a very good job of, you know, gifted child is different from a bright child. A bright child will understand everything that you tell. A gifted child will think different. And this is where the teacher's role becomes important. Whenever I give a lecture, I always allow for the fact that somebody in the audience may know more than me, maybe smarter than me. But sometimes, you know, teachers get offended if the child is smarter than school teachers. Teachers must be sensitive. I remember not only in India, one of my friend's daughters, five-year-old, five-year-old, went to kindergarten. She was in kindergarten. And the teacher who was teaching numbers, five and seven, she said, seven is larger than five. You can subtract five from seven, but you can't subtract seven from five. 
and this tiny one pipe that was the problem answer is minus 2 you know from that type on but the teacher became hostile and the mother and god had got to go and talk to the teacher it happens in the of course there are so many you must, you must all remember so many other sources of knowledge for the young guys don't think you go on googling everything and then ask your professor that's not the point you must ask sensible questions which relate to the topic under discussion i'm not talking about showing off genuine doubts genuine doubts which you have so you see all these interactions between national labs and universities iit is taking care of schools in your neighborhood and this is one thing that we discussed and dr murthy you also said how many colleges and we, are, we have more than 10 yeah we we have adopted about five villages nearby sir five villages. okay and we are doing that about 10 colleges we are Very adopting okay. we have to uh, you know uh, india's uh, technology needs range from nuclear to rural all over the place for example dr murthy can i request you that yes. after a few years intervention by iit hyderabad that village should have 100% female literacy okay sir because in india female literacy is always lower than male literacy and the lower the average literacy the higher is the difference so if you guarantee 100% female literacy 100% male literacy no this is very easy question for your comment for consideration See, many of your top faculty marry women who sometimes are not fully employed i hope the same thing is done with husbands who marry the faculty professors lady lady faculty professors whatever for them to give them a chance to go to villages provide them only two things i don't think they care even for money transport and security if they are able to go there help them you know there are small things application for something a loan or you know you got or some help in tell them where to go for whatever and suddenly they can teach them of course take the schools because the school teachers shouldn't think they are interfering in the what is their responsibility the all this one can do with very very little also self satisfying you know whatever you say even if you do a small thing to some needy person there is nothing like altruism somebody said to get happiness from doing an altruistic deed well your reward is already there okay i think i if you let me i will go on and on try thank stop you. <laughs> thank you sir thank just to add uh, this word of uh, uh, you know collaborating with laboratories we have recently taken about 20 phd students who will work with drdo labs they are not funded by drdo labs they are not drdo scientists they are phd students directly admitted here who will have one supervisor here and one uh, supervisor from one of the drdo labs so that we work on targeted delivery okay on certain technologies so that is we feel that kind of a collaboration will really yield great results So, and one of the things you know, I said in different contexts, uh, when you have a co-guide from a DRDO lab or in BRC, even BRC, the student automatically has access to all the advanced facilities in their lab. After he is a student also, sure, make sure. full use of that. Make full use of that. Park him there for some days. Sure. Use the supercomputer there, or the program there, or the electron microscope, or an MR, whatever facility they have, or materials fabricating facility. Sure. Take somebody from DMRL sure. and get all your materials fabricated in DMRL or Medhani or whatever. Anyway, I think it's a very good. Thank idea. you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Any more, Ikshita? Yes, sir. Uh, we do have a question from Shantanu Desai. uh the question reads what are your thoughts about cold fusion is this something worth researching into the future which could lead to a breakthrough or whether this is something which will only remain in the dark is one of our faculty members sir yes you know cold fusion has its own advocates and unfortunately i am not one of the supporters you know normally as i understand my physics 
the fusion is between the uh, isotopes of hydrogen and their charged particles charged particles now they don't like to come near each other but to give them sheer kinetic energy at 50 to 100 million degrees centigrade in a plasma so that by sheer kinetic energy they come to each other that's why the fusion cross section is a function of temperature so in an electrochemical reaction how does fusion take place that has not yet been satisfactorily explained that is but then there are people as one great enthusiast of cold fusion abroad who took a photograph with me when i was visiting the guest house at the indian institute of science and published it with the implication maybe i am supporting cold fusion abroad <laughs> i was only friendly with him in that as far as that photograph my great friend yam srinivasan who just passed away he is a very good reactor physics so oh, i think if you finally you know you believe in it something go ahead and push it it is your responsibility to prove you know the old thing used to say when somebody announced a discovery first they will say it against the bible second they will say it is wrong third they will say i always said it was obvious who knows but at the moment i don't think it is going to yeah is at least i think i need at least let me put it more positively i need some more convincing all right sir thank you uh, we do have uh, one more question from our faculty uh, mayil vedya uh, he says can you share your views on setting up a laboratory which uses radioactive isotopes to do fundamental research at an academic institution like iit hyderabad absolutely entirely up to you and the isotopes are are supplied by the board of radiation and isotope technology of course you have to convince them that you have a problem See, after all radioactive tracers are used in everything whether it is medicine take a glass of water containing radioactive iodine and i'll take a thyroid scan and tell you whether your thyroid is functioning properly or not if you are a hydro engineer take a bit of radio isotope and i can tell you where the leakage in the dam is in everywhere you can see up tracer technique because it's a signature take the proper isotope and it is absolutely possible want for you to talk to the people concerned and give them the plan and you can set up your but then you know you will be regulated by the atomic energy regulation sure, sure. safety the safety things are will be involved in other mayur mayur works in the area of tracer diffusion in uh, metals and alloys so that is what possibly he is referring to yeah. yes mayur it should be possible it should be okay, possible you. and you also make sure that if you have made any material radioactive by sending it inside they have to devise method of disposing it out. disposing so all that any anyway, regulatory board will tell you how to handle there is no problem at all he has spent for 2 years in munster yeah. in a, a tracer diffusion laboratory so he knows possibly all the ways of how to this uh, is radiation and isotope technology right which is located just right to right to them of course a very rare isotope you are looking for then you will have to go through an r&d procedure for that so it's a common isotope yes. all right we yes. also have a question from a youtube audience um the question on effects of artificial intelligence on employment in indian context in a decade or so from now artificial intelligence on employment <laughs> robots should consider as part of uh, artificial intelligence ask the professor obviously obviously robots have come 
robots have come we use you know we use robots to handle hazardous material radioactive material is always handled using pick and place seeking radioactive it is all done uh, by this or hazardous explosives we use silvia who can do anything you ask her looks like a human as things like a human so a correspondent asks her to talk like a human you respond like a human what is it that makes you a robot by the way sofia is a saudi arabian citizen but that's a difference you know that and sofia asked this cnn correspondent you please tell me what is it that makes you follow up the answer you know so there are ways this going to come but you know robots cannot communicate as well as humans can communicate single robots i think they will take over most of that two things are going to happen in my opinion as india advances as the world advances jobs more and more jobs are going to have a higher intellectual content and it is the lower level jobs which will be routine jobs sometimes soul killing jobs which will be taken over by the robots and the humans in my opinion more to more more intellectual jobs or a different kind of jobs you know to to control robots also require but if you have Uh, more than one robot in an assembly line what is assembly line how do the interactive robots these are all like my own feeling you know on computers are in <laughs> actually it means we will see a dichotomy between a globalized world where knowledge human resources are shared across international boundaries without barriers to science and technology and the self reliant view where the emphasis is on indigenous Yeah. Can you? This is a very interesting. Can you repeat it again slowly, please, and louder? Yes, sir. Sure, sir. Do you see a dichotomy between a globalized world where knowledge, human resources are shared across international boundaries without barriers for science and technology, and a self-reliant view where the emphasis is on indigenization? Indigenization. Yes. See, uh, that is what I said. Self. self reliance or atman nirbharta doesn't mean yes see uh, that is what i said self self reliance or atman nirbharta doesn't mean yourself i have always said an x system and something is available to you from out source don't waste your time developing that you build the big system that is what everybody in the world does even the biggest they farm it out at one time they are farming it out to china and thailand and all that but now you can burn your fingers when you do that kind of thing uh, that's what the americans are now uh, discovering right to you including the proverbial wheel you must have the capability to do it yourself so to ransom boundaries are discovered you know at one time bell labs used to be called idea factory bell labs you know the idea of the principle of the transistor was discovered by bell labs and they made money out of the transistor but today because of the internet any discovery anywhere in the world is known all over the bell lab says why do i waste time on basic research but i go and do only take it up and do only the money making part that comes that comes later so the basic research has in my opinion to be to be supported more and more by the government this is inevitably happening sharing of uh, sharing of knowledge but then to be convoluted with the two third property rights and technology control regimes iprs are still very much in vogue people deny you unless you pay royalty to them or you pay some technology charge or cost that is not going to go away i think and you must atmanirbharta means you balance this 
you take technology from outside you must have the capability to supply technology to the others it becomes a kind of zero sum zero sum game zero sum game so it is not as self reliance in my opinion at least because it's actually it's absurdity to think everything we must do ourselves just not just not possible but some place raw material you